Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think a lot of you don't realize the Tobolowsky Files has been going on for almost 10 years now. But when David Chen first called me about trying to do real, true stories about life, love, and Hollywood, this story that I'm going to tell you today, this story is the one I wanted to tell. It's, it's called The Afflictions of Love. And it is... It is about not just one, but a series of the strangest events that ever happened to me. I have experienced a miracle, a real miracle, I think. And it's odd to talk about because we live in an age that disparages miracles somewhat. And I don't think it's because of lack of belief. Because from my experience, people are capable of believing in anything. I've been to Comic-Con, I know. <laughs> yeah. I think the problem with miracles is that we don't have a good universal definition. The main two ways we experience miracles in our everyday life is either stories in the Bible or movies on the Hallmark Channel. And they see miracles completely differently. Uh, in the Bible, if it is parting of the Red Sea or Moses at the burning bush. A miracle is something that comes outside of man, outside of nature. And this event intrudes into the lives of men and women with the purpose of changing the course of events, changing the inevitable. On the Hallmark Channel, and, and it doesn't matter what movie it is. It could be Mrs. Miracle or The Dog That Saved Christmas. The miracle does not come from outside of nature, but comes from within the central character itself. And it doesn't matter who that protagonist is. It could be the hardworking single mom with the precocious 10-year-old child. It could be the aging golden retriever rescued from the pound. The stories are the same. And that is events are grim, but then a miracle will arise from the inherent goodness of the central character and goodness will take the day. I don't know if I believe in either of those definitions. So I'm going to tell you the story of my miracle. And it's as true as I can possibly make it. Um, one thing that's interesting when, I, when I've told this story before, I keep hearing a miracle in a different part of the story when I tell it. So you can use this as kind of a psychological profile as to where you hear the miracle if you hear one at all. You will be the judge. I think for the start of it, I have to go back to 2006. I was having a bit of a health crisis. I was losing my voice. And, and I don't mean I was getting hoarse. I mean my voice was going away. And I didn't know what was going on. Uh, it's terrifying. To be a working actor in Hollywood, you either have to have a voice or well-defined abs. And it was too hard for me to keep doing the sit-ups. I wasn't going to do the crunches anymore. So my wife said, you have to go to a doctor. And I ended up going to a very good one, Sean Nassari, who, who who is the doctor who takes care of all the American Idol people when they ruined their voice on that show. <laughs> so I went in to see Sean and he looked and I had a, uh, a growth on one of my vocal cords the size of a macadamia nut. Now, yeah, it's bad. But the good news was it was not cancerous. But what happens is the growth was so large it kept the vocal cords from touching. So if there is no vibration, there is no sound. And the short version of it is Sean said, felt I needed surgery like yesterday. But it wasn't going to be that simple. It wasn't going to be as simple as uh, snip, snip, cut, cut, and everything's going to be better. The growth had injured one of the vocal cords, so there was a hemorrhage on the vocal cord. So Sean told me I was going to have to be absolutely silent for one month for the vocal cord to heal, then have surgery, 
then be absolutely silent for a second month for the surgery to heal. So I was going to have to be absolutely silent for two straight months. And that's not, <laughs> that's not the miracle. No, that's not the miracle. <laughs> That was difficult, but that was not the miracle. There, there, there is a much better miracle in this story, I promise you. Uh, you learn a lot when you have to be silent for a long period of time. Uh, the first thing you learn is you didn't have a lot to say to begin with. The world goes on just fine without your input. And, and you get into a different rhythm. After about two weeks of being silent, instead of looking for the next opportunity to speak, like we always do, like red hot peppers, instead you sit back and you listen. And as you listen, you start to hear everything that was unheard. And what I began to hear in the silence was something far more sinister than anything going on with, with my voice. I heard in the silence that I was having headaches. I recognized I had had headaches for months, but had ignored it in all of the noise. And these headaches were persistent. They were constant. They woke me up at night, which I knew was a bad sign. I looked it up on WebMD and I was certain I had a brain tumor. I went to Sean. Uh, uh, Sean had given me a pad of paper and a pen to write all my thoughts down so I wouldn't have to speak. And I was writing down uh, Sean probable brain tumor. Uh, he said he was a throat doctor. Uh, he didn't do heads. So I had to go to a head and neck specialist, one of his colleagues. And I'm writing down, head and neck specialist? Who has a head and neck specialist? Sean took the pen from me and wrote down, you do. <laughs> so I went to his colleague, the head and neck specialist. They gave me an MRI and several x-rays. And he brought me into his office. And there on the screen was the ghostly image of my head and neck. And the good news was I did not have a brain tumor. He said the reason I was having headaches was because I had arthritis of the neck. Not just arthritis of the neck, I had advanced arthritis of the neck, and not just advanced arthritis, I had one of the worst cases of advanced arthritis of the neck he had ever seen, which was pretty depressing, because I figured this guy had done nothing but look at necks for his whole life. <laughs> and, and this is the physiology of it all. All, all of us sitting here, except for me, uh, we all have a curve in our cervical spine like so, right? My arthritis was so bad, it had warped and deformed my neck to be opposite of a normal human being. And it made the vertebra enlarged, overlapping, distended, bone on bone. I left the head and neck specialist silent and deformed. I went back over to Sean's office and started writing the long and sad story of my deformed vertebra. And he took the pad from me and said, Stephen, listen, you have got to relax. This, this stress that you have, it's going to harm your healing. After we finish the surgery, I want you to go out into nature. Uh, maybe go play golf or something. Obviously, the doctor was not a golfer. He didn't understand that golf was invented to ruin good days. <laughs> My wife, Ann, said, well, Stephen, maybe we could take this as an opportunity to go horseback riding in Iceland. <laughs> it sounded exotic, but it wasn't really. Ann and I loved to ride. And uh, our trainer in Los Angeles was from Iceland. We had visited him a couple times before and ridden horses there. Uh, and horseback riding can be very relaxing as long as you wear the right underwear. <laughs> so we were going on a trip. It was going to be 10 day, 10 day vacation in Iceland, first three on horseback. And this is how it was going to, we were going to be about 12 riders and we were going to herd 50 loose horses from one part of the island to another part of the island. And along the way, we were going to go over mountains and through rivers and across plains, and we were going to end up on the side of an active volcano. Sounded dangerous. It was. So the last ride of the last day, 
we were up on Mount Hetla. That was the volcano, Mount Hetla. And my horse was in the lead. And uh, we were coming around the corner when I was hit by a wind. And I should let you know that Iceland is infamous for gigantic winds and waves that come off of the Atlantic Ocean. And this wind, this is the truth, was so strong, it lifted me and the horse off the ground, carried us over the road, dropped us. At this point, the horse thought it was God saying, giddy up. And he took off with me trying to get my balance on the side of the horse. And somewhere on the other side of the mountain, I was thrown onto a hardened lava flow not real lava, old lava, hard lava. Now, uh, according to legend, the head of the Icelandic riding group came to my rescue and he said he found me in the only piece of soft vegetation on the entire flow in a fetal position. He came with a horse, uh, a spare horse, and he said when he arrived, I jumped up got on to the spare horse, said I felt sick. He said, well, maybe you were hurt in the fall. I said, what fall? He said, get off the horse. <laughs> now, I have no idea if any of that is true because somewhere along the way, I hit my head so hard, it cracked my riding helmet and I suffered a terrible concussion and my consciousness was operating in about a 30 to 90 second loop over and over again. So now I'm going to tell you my version of what happened that day. So right before that final ride, I got on my horse and I felt that the girth was a little loose and I asked one of the riding assistants if he could tighten the girth. And so as he was doing that, I looked up and I saw storm clouds coming in over Mount Hetla. And it got my attention because the clouds were moving so quickly. And I was trying to decide if I should put my rain fly up over my helmet or not. And then a drop of rain fell and landed in between my glasses and my cheek and ran down my face. And then everything went to blackness. When my vision cleared, I looked at my wife's face and I said, where am I? And she said, you're in Iceland. You were thrown from a horse, you're hurt. We're on our way to Reykjavik uh, to get x-rays. And in my head, I was going like, what, thrown from a horse? This is crazy, I'm a good writer. I can't think of the last time I was thrown from a horse. And did she say we were going to the hospital? This must be serious and wait a minute. What did she say about Iceland? I had so many questions in my head and I opened my mouth to speak and what came out was, where am I? She said, you're in Iceland. You were thrown from a horse, you're hurt. We're on our way to Reykjavik to get you X. And while she's talking, I am sensing motion and I'm able to see that I am strapped onto a metal gurney and there's some sort of metal cage strapped onto the gurney holding me in place. And then I hear a siren and I'm going, my God, I'm in an ambulance. And then everything went to black. And when my vision cleared, and I swear to you, I'm telling the truth. I was in Los Angeles. I'm not saying I was dreaming I was in Los Angeles. I was in Los Angeles at a party. And there were people there I knew and there were people there I didn't know. Gloria Estevan was playing in the kitchen. I was sitting at a painted white patio table and it had been spray painted white, it was metal, and some of the paint had flicked off and I could see where there was corrosion on, uh, starting on the metal and the hostess saw me and she knew me and she came over and said, Stephen, what are you doing here? And I said, I don't know. I think maybe I wanted to tell everyone I'm all right. And she said, good, good. Uh, do you want anything to drink? I said, yeah, what you got? She said, well, we have iced tea. Iced tea's great. 
I said, I am so thirsty. Please, iced tea is great. And she went off to get the iced tea. And I'm looking and along the corner of the property, there are roses, uh, but it's like end of summer roses interspersed with society garlic. And when the wind shifted, I was able to smell that hot rose smell that you get here in Los Angeles interspersed with the society garlic. Uh, I see her wind her way through the crowd with my iced tea. She hands it to me, the ice clinked in the glass. She hands it to me, I grab it, it's cold and wet, and there is a drop of condensation running down the side of the glass. I go to drink it and there are two flies buzzing around the top of the glass and I brush them with my hand. I felt the weight of the flies on my hand. And I took the tea and I drank it and it was so good. It was so delicious. And obviously I think I was a little over emotional when I was drinking the tea and she said, Stephen, are you all right? And I said, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's just, what's happening to me? Oh my God. I, if you only knew where I thought I was and what I thought had happened to me, no, I'm fine here with the iced tea. This is great. And she said, well, do you want anything to eat? I said, sure. What you got? She said, we have pita bread and hummus. I said, bring it on. Love the hummus. <laughs> she went to go get it. I'm drinking the iced tea. I look out at the backyard. There's a small swimming pool in the middle of the backyard. And when the wind shifts, I could smell the chlorine coming off the water. I look and there's a telegraph, a telegraph, telephone pole, this wrong century. <laughs> telephone pole. And there are two sparrows on the telephone pole on the wire. And I look and they fly away. And then I see her coming through the crowd, carrying the pita and the hummus. And as she does so, everything goes to black. And when my vision clears, I see my wife's face. And I say, where am I? And she begins her litany again. We're in Iceland. You were thrown from a horse. You're hurt. I said, that's not what I meant. A new sentence that got her attention. And she says, what do you mean, Stephen? I said, have we been here in Iceland the whole time? What whole time? Annie said, I said, I know this sounds crazy, but I think I was just in Los Angeles. Is it possible that I could have vanished for a few minutes? gone to Los Angeles and returned to the back of this ambulance. Have you been with me the whole time? Oh my God, the things that went through her eyes. <laughs> and she said, no, you're here. We're both here. They drove us to an ambulance in Reykjavik and a young doctor gave me a CAT scan of my head and neck, which they burned onto a DVD which I called Stephen Tobolowsky's greatest hit. <laughs> Took me back to an examining room and the young doctor said that it looked like I probably had a fracture in one of my neck vertebra. And Anne says, well, what does that mean? Does that mean we have to go back tonight? Does that mean we have to stay six more months? And he said, no, 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 no. Just go about your vacation. Uh, just stay away from any physical activity and certainly stay away from the horses. I said, no problem there. Uh, the doctor fitted me with one of those soft collars that they use on sitcoms to indicate someone has been injured. <laughs> and for the rest of the, that week, we went and saw horse shows and uh, ate hot dogs. And just as a point of reference, Iceland has the best hot dogs in the world. I fear because they're made with the losers of the horse show. <laughs> they don't waste stuff in that country, small island. Uh, at the end of the time, we flew back and I'm in Kennedy Airport and we're switching planes for Los Angeles. And this older man with a gray beard comes up to me. Uh, he recognized me from Deadwood. 
I can always tell the Deadwood fans, the men have beards and uh, the women have tattoos. So he, he, he came up to me and he said, what, do you, what are you wearing the uh, collar for? Is it to get past security in some way? I said, no, sir, no, sir. I had some sort of accident in Iceland. And I think I have some sort of fractured neck vertebra. And he pulled me aside and he was very serious. And he says, I am the head of neurosurgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. And you are in the wrong brace. That brace does not have the support for air travel, takeoffs, landings, any sudden turbulence, you could die. You need to hold your head like this, the entire flight home. And when you get back to Los Angeles, somehow, some way, you got to find a head and neck specialist. <laughs> it was a miracle. I told him I already had a head and neck specialist. I'd had him two months ago when I thought I had a brain tumor. He said, calm down, calm down. Just hold your head like this. Call the head and neck specialist when you get back to Los Angeles, which I did. And this fact I will share with you. You can use this anytime you want. When you call up a doctor and say broken neck, you do move to the front of the line. So the head and neck specialist threw away my my uh, soft collar started fitting me for the hard brace. I didn't have one of those halo things, but I had a very hard neck brace, so I'm walking like this. I give him a copy of Stephen Tobolowsky's greatest hit. <laughs> He's looking at it, he does more x-rays, calls me back in his office and sits me down and he is ashen. And he says, Stephen, you were misdiagnosed in Iceland. You don't have a fractured vertebra. Your entire neck is broken. Five vertebra, C2 to C6, multiple breaks in each vertebra. And the vertebra in the middle, C4, is crushed. You have a fatal injury. Do you want to know why you're alive? And at this point, I'm like this in the brace. Uh-huh. <laughs> Most people have a curve in their cervical spine like so. Because your curve was the opposite of a normal human being, a lot of the blow went into your shoulders instead of snapping your neck because your vertebra were enlarged, distended, bone on bone, overlapping. They acted like armor. They saved your life. Stephen. Your arthritis saved your life. So, <laughs> I am trying to focus on this curse that had turned into a blessing and the mountains of circumstance which enabled me to see another day. And it made me rethink the definition of miracle. What if miracle and catastrophe are not two different events that happen on the outskirts of probability. But what if miracle and catastrophe are part of the same event, and that event is not outside of nature, but is one of the engines of nature itself? What if a miracle is the occasional injection of chaos, which changes the course of events, which changes fate? Then it made me wonder if that's true. Where do we see miracle? Where do we find it? So I asked the doctor, I said, how do I heal? And he said, well, actually, this is a, a very interesting process. What happens is it, it always takes three months. The first month, all the little bone fragments come and find one another and fit together. After a second month, they form a soft bond, third month, a hard bond, and you are healed. And I said, that's very interesting, but that wasn't exactly the question I was asking. It wasn't not how long it takes me to heal, but how does all this happen? How do the little bones know to find one another and fit together? And the doctor looked at me and said, oh, Stephen, no one knows that. That's a mystery. So the thing 
I call miracle was inside of me all along, just like they said on the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> My whole life, I thought I needed a telescope or a microscope to see a miracle. I had no idea. All I needed was a mirror. If the thing we call miracle is inside of us all the time, and the purpose of miracle is to change the course of events, then the only question any of us have is, what are we going to do today? What are we going to do today to change the inevitable? Or better still, what are we going to do today to create a new inevitable? Now, if O. Henry wrote this story, he would stop right now. We have reached a very satisfying but ironic conclusion where the blessing was the curse, the curse was the blessing. Uh, but life isn't literature. I'm sitting in the doctor's chair now. I am convinced I have experienced a miracle. And it doesn't matter how you parse out the story. If it's the collusion of cervical vertebra, if it's astro projecting to a party in Los Angeles, or just meeting the man from Mount Sinai, I thought I had not only experienced a miracle, but I was alive because of it. I knew that in three months, I was going to be as good as new. I was walking home now with my wife to see my children. And as this was going on, I had never felt such despair. Here I am, the luckiest guy in the solar system. And I felt like I was at the end of me and I didn't know what to do about it. And it didn't stop there. It got worse every day, day after day. I felt I was vanishing into sorrow. And I thought I had to figure this out before I am obliterated. So I came up with a theory. And I offer it to you for your perusal. It seems that people generally view their lives as simple arithmetic. And people like it best when it's addition. Stephen plus clean sheets, good. Uh, Stephen plus doing stories here at the White Fire Theater, wonderful. Stephen plus the beer I'm probably going to have this evening when this is all done, fantastic. And there was a clue that even the thought of addition in the future was enough to make me happy, as long as it was something small like beer. Didn't work for cancer or peace on earth, addition. Subtraction is a completely different animal. When you've experienced a loss, an illness, when you are in despair, it is very easy to see your life as a form of subtraction. And even though I'm the luckiest guy in the solar system, I was surrounded by subtraction. I was Stephen minus mobility. I'm, I'm in the brace. I could hardly do anything for myself. My wife had to help me put on my shoes and occasionally help me eat. Uh, I obviously could not audition, so I was Stephen minus a job, Stephen minus money. I was fearful for my family. And here came the first corollary to the addition subtraction theorem. Adding fear does not count as addition. Somehow fear acts like a negative number, and when you add fear, you're really subtracting. And you could remember it with this little mnemonic, and that is, Fear is the opposite of beer. <laughs> there were some other surprising subtractions in all of this. One is, when you have a broken neck, you have to stay vertical for three months. That one wasn't in the brochure. <laughs> Which means, if you need to sleep, right, you have to find a wall and get up against the wall or wedge yourself into a corner so you stay upright. It's like waiting at a bus stop forever. Uh, I thought, well, maybe I could exercise some. That would give me strength and, and stamina. But I found out that with the hard brace on, it acted like a tourniquet for snake bite. And if I just walked a few yards away from the house, I was afraid my head was going to pop. So 
no exercise, no sense of well-being. You hit the uh, total button. And even though I'm Mr. Lucky, I'm drowning in a sea of subtraction. So I thought I have to find some way of turning my life into addition if this theory is true. And this is difficult because there wasn't a lot I could do. I could sit. So I thought, what if I sat in a place that I never sat before? Possible, would this work? So at our house, you come out the back door and there's the patio and we have a series of benches and chairs, kind of patio furniture stuff. Then there is this wild, crazy area filled with trees and bushes and wild blackberry bushes. No one has touched it for years. Got to call the gardener about that. Then there's the area where I planted roses. Uh, next, it's also the pet cemetery. <laughs> And then at the very back of the yard is a barren area, which we wistfully call the vegetable garden. <laughs> so I'm thinking, no one, no one has ever sat in the crazy wild area before, ever. And so my wife helped me move a bench to that area. And I sat down. And it was remarkable. Just sitting down and looking at the tree from a different angle. I felt better. And looking at the different patterns of sunshine and shadow on the ground. And, and from the bench, I could smell the roses, which I planted right before we went to Iceland. They were starting to bloom and I could smell the aroma of those roses. And I felt so good that I wrote in my little book, when the problems of your life seem insurmountable, move your bench. And that became my day. I would wake up in the morning, get dressed, have breakfast, go outside, and watch the world go round. And you would think that there would not be a lot of variation, but you would be wrong. It was remarkable what you would see. It was small and in a different rhythm than we're used to. But sometimes I saw amazing things. One morning, I saw a small bird falling from the tree and was trying desperately to right itself and it caught onto a branch before it hit the ground and then began the arduous climb back up the tree and I'm watching and then a second bird falls from the tree and it catches before it hits the ground and it starts crawling too and I start looking at the birds going up the branch and there on a branch on top of the tree is a big bird pushing a third bird off. So I'm thinking, what, a bird bully? What is this? So I'm watching and by this time, the first bird had gotten to the branch where the big bird was and walks over to the big bird, gets in front of it. It was all very orderly and the big bird pushes it off again. And I'm thinking, is this six flags for birds? And then it hits me. I was watching a mother bird teach her babies how to fly. It was amazing. And I never would have seen it if I had moved my bench. You know, this addition thing was kind of working. So I thought, what else is there I can add? I could read, I could read. But just like the bench, it wouldn't be good enough to read something I would read every day, like a newspaper, a magazine, or bestseller, science book, whatever. I had to read something I never would have read in a million years. That way, in the future, when I was healed, I would be able to pass that bookshelf and see that book on the shelf and know I read that book at this time when I thought all was lost. I would have taken our greatest gift, which is time, and I would have honored it with choice. So the book I chose was the Jewish Talmud. Uh, it's not really a book, it's 71 volumes written 2,000 years ago in Hebrew and Aramaic. No, I don't speak Hebrew or Aramaic, but I had a couple volumes at home with good English translations. Always thought I'd get into it someday. No time like the present. So I take the volume of the Talmud outside, sit on my bench, open it up, and begin to read. And my first impressions of the Talmud was, 
This book reads like a book that was written 2,000 years ago in Aramaic. <laughs> I couldn't make heads or tails of this book. I mean, characters, people, places, laws that I had no idea, circular logic going around and around, but I had time. So I kept reading. And in two weeks, I got my reward. I came across a section in the Talmud that was so remarkable. It was my life. And it said sometimes when a person has been injured or suffered an illness or a terrible loss, it is not a curse, but a blessing, a divine blessing to help that person see the world with different eyes, to raise them to a different level of spiritual awareness. And this thing had a name. It was called the afflictions of love. And I thought, oh, if such a thing were true, then I wouldn't have to worry about all this addition and subtraction stuff. My affliction would be my addition, and I would carry it with me wherever I go. So I took my pad of paper, and I wrote down afflictions of love, and just then a seed pod from our magnolia tree fell about 10 feet away from me. And I don't know if you have magnolia trees, but those seed pods are like six inches long, hard as a rock, and falling 30 feet, if that thing hit me in the head, it would pretty much end the job that the horse started. <laughs> then I see another seed pod land like six feet from me, closer. So I try to look up to see what's going on, and I hear this chattering, and there's a squirrel jumping from the magnolia tree to the avocado tree. And he grabs a baby avocado and bites through the stem and throws it down on me and lands on the bench next to me. I'm thinking, that's not an accident. That was Al-Qaeda squirrel, <laughs> a terrorist out to kill me. So I ran inside. My wife, Ann, is ironing. I said, Annie, Annie, Al-Qaeda squirrel is outside. He's trying to kill me by throwing baby avocados at my head. She's staring at me and says, wear a helmet. Of course, there is no peace without safety. So I take my old horseback riding helmet and I put it back on. I get my Talmud for safety. I go back outside, grab a few kumquats from the kumquat tree in case Al Qaeda gets close enough for me to launch a preemptive strike. <laughs> I sit down and sure enough, I hear this chattering. And Al Qaeda squirrel comes down the tree and starts staring at me. So I put the Talmud aside reach into my pocket for the kumquats, and I let him have it. And this is when I learned that when you are in a neck brace and you have a broken <laughs> neck, it is impossible to throw a kumquat with the speed and accuracy necessary to hit a living squirrel. Al-Qaeda thought I was trying to feed him. <laughs> Addition by kumquat for Al-Qaeda squirrel. <laughs> so. This became the daily ritual. I would go out with kumquats, try to feed Al-Qaeda some kumquats to appease him and create a Disney moment at the same time, <laughs> and, and then go to reading. But no, he kept throwing things down at my head. So I called my wife, Ann, out to get a woman's perspective on the problem. She came out and looked up at Al-Qaeda, looked down at my bench, looked up, and she said, well, you know, he probably thinks you're trying to challenge him as alpha male for rights to all the females in this area. And I said, Al alpha male, how do you even know he's a guy? She said, you wanted a woman's perspective, take a good look. I did, and he was hung like a woodchuck. <laughs> I said, baby, look, he can have all the females in the backyard as long as he leaves you alone. She said, tell him that. So the battle continued. Uh, I kept moving my bench further back into the yard. Al-Qaeda kept throwing uh, seed pods and little avocados at me. We moved back through the rose garden, through the vegetable garden. I ended up in this area of the yard that I had never been in before. Uh, way back in the corner of the yard, the, the main virtue of this part of the yard was it was too far for Al-Qaeda to drop things on me. Now he would have to heave them, and I just didn't think he had the manpower to do it. 
So I start reading my Talmud again. And ironically, I was reading a chapter on the power of prayer in exile. And as I was reading the Talmud in my peripheral vision, I see flashes of purple and gold and bright green. And I look up and the back of my tree, the magnolia tree is covered with wild parrots, parrots. And I think back 35 years to when I came out to Los Angeles and I heard the apocryphal story uh, from a couple friends of mine, T-Bone and Betty, about a fire in a pet store in Studio City and the owner could not save uh, all of his animals. He saved his dogs and cats, but for the birds, all he could do was open the cages and hope they would fly free. And the story was that somewhere in Studio City, there were still flocks of wild parrots from this fire. Well, not only was the apocryphal true, but they were living in my tree. And I never would have seen it if I had not moved my bench. The final blessing that came to me during this terrible three month period of time came via messenger. It was for a script for a new television show called Glee. And uh, my agent called me up and asked me if I was up for an interview. And I said, whether I'm up for it or not, I'm going in. If nothing else, it's going to be addition by audition. I go, what? <laughs> so I take Glee, I put the Talmud down, pick up the script of Glee. Oh, that was a change. <laughs> and I start reading the script and I see they were interested in me uh, for a part that was the singing, dancing pedophile again. <laughs> but there was something life affirming about the script. I loved it. And as I'm reading and working on the part of Sandy Ryerson, I see a shadow coming over the yard, over my script, and I don't even have to look up. I'm, read, I'm reading the script because I know from the shape of the shadow and the shape of the wings and the flight path, it's just one of the parrots coming back to live in my tree. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, that's the nature of miracles. It's easy to recognize the shadow once you've seen the real thing. And I stand up and I look at the yard and it's covered with shadow and light. And I've always been one of those people that thought the shadows were just a part of the darkness. But what if one, just one of those shadows was like one of the parrots, the shadow of a miracle unobserved. And my vision changed. I was never able to see anything the same way again. I don't know what happened that day. I don't know if I was just happy that the three months were over and I was healed. I don't know if I was giddy because I had an audition or if maybe, just maybe, I had a parting gift from the afflictions of love. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, this is Stephen Tobolowsky, but of course you know that because you just watch me. If you're interested in more storytelling, you got to do three things. Hit subscribe, hit like, and hit that bell icon. I hear it's magic. Also, if you're interested in the Tobolowsky files, check out the links below. Thank you.